If he's already dead. Once Knox is on the job, it's over, baby. It's just a matter of when. This is Johnny with Tiger Bomb MMA, and today we have a very special episode of Tiger Bomb MMA because it is the return of Conor McGregor if the outfit didn't give it away. So in honor of the return of the Mac for McGregor versus Chandler, I am doing a very special one-of-a-kind Conor extravaganza. McGregor extravaganza for the entire card. I've been waiting for Conor to come back for the longest time, especially against Michael Chandler. So now that this is finally happening, and I mean, they are two of my favorite fighters, and I really appreciate Michael Chandler taking the time, waiting for Conor to come back, and just accepting the fact that he's going to get knocked out. But, you know, as much as it sucks that he's going to get really bad CTE, I can at least be confident and sure that his family is going to be fine with that red panty night. So I am thrilled to have the Mac back. So this entire card, I will be breaking down each and every fight, giving you my thoughts on it, uh, what I think as the matchup would be versus McGregor himself. So I'll give you all that. But before I break down this card, I wanted to give you my thoughts on the previous card. Very lacking of Connor, if I'm being honest. I could use more Connor, so it wasn't the best card, especially because it was in Saudi Arabia. The Connor's not really into the sand, but I'll give you my quick thoughts on that. Betting wise, I broke even. I uh, let me let me stress this primarily. Um, Irish Johnny Walker. I when when I get in contact with Connor, and I will. Uh, he has to call me back eventually. But when I get in contact with Connor, I need him to revoke his visa because Irish Connie, uh, Johnny Walker really made a mockery of that gym, the SBG gym, the, the gym that Connor built. So he cost me a pretty good payday. I had, had him on a parlay with Renat. Um, other than that, you know, I, I made most of my money back with the over one and a half with uh, Volkov, which I think a lot of people were on that. I saw it mostly as like plus money. So I'm like, fuck it, why not? And on top of that, I did take uh, Volkov plus 180-ish. I don't remember exactly how much, so I made my money back. But damn, that Irish Johnny Walker SBG kick him out of Ireland. Yeah, first fight of the night. It was, uh, yeah, split decision win. Not much to say there. Uh, Kung Ho Lee defeated uh, Long Zhao. Uh, yeah, it was what it was. It didn't matter. Uh, Magomed, uh, whatever his last name, MG. Uh, <sighs> kind of a fraudy performance. He ended up beating Brendis and Ribeiro. I actually live bet Ribeiro. I did a lot of live betting because I thought, ooh, here we go. This guy's hurt. Ribeiro hurt his leg. Yeah, he couldn't capitalize. What a douche. But anyways, I still thought that Magomed was very fraudulent here. Same as Fraud... Fraud... Uh, fraud Farov? Gaffer Fraud? He... 30-27 the guy. But what's crazy, what's crazy, bro, is that if you let a dude mount you, full mount you, I don't think that's a great performance. I mean, he won. He won every round. He came back and he hit, he hurt um, Mr. Perfect and whatnot, but he got mounted twice to me. I think he, <laughs> he must have been on the finest potatoes, if you know what I'm saying, in Saudi Arabia, and uh, he, he pulled that one out of his ass. Renat Fakhardinov gets a split decision when I thought he did enough to beat Dalby. Dalby, you know, I, th I think um, his Pride Month uh, act tactics really didn't fly in Saudi Arabia. They're like, we're not going to reward this buffoonery. Felipe Lima, my lord, Felipe Lima. Connor would be proud of this kid. He he looked really good early on. He he actually was like beating uh, whatever this bum's name is that I can't read. Where'd he go? Yeah, Naimov. He was whipping Naimov's ass early. He looked like a contender right off the bat, just in the wrong weight class. And then, you know, Naimov did standard Naimov things. He was just a little heavier. He's a little bigger. And uh, look at that bling, baby. And he eventually... Shit the bed, which, you know, that's the main thing. Like, I almost took Naimov, or not Naimov, I'm sorry, but I almost took Lima, but I, oh, I was like, let's let's hold off on this. He looks like he's not really pulling the trigger. He looks a little, like, off. So when he got that submission, I was like, oh, my Lord, this is going to be, like, the best night. You know, props for him. He got a performance of the night bonus. Uh, Nazrat Hackbrass defeats uh, Jared Gordon. Now, I will say, Jared Gordon put up a pretty good fight. He took the shots well. He put pressure on Nazrat. I thought Nazrat round number one. He won round number one. Gordon won round number two. It's really hard to say. He won now round number two. Uh, then round number three, it was pretty dead even. So when people were like, oh, my God, Jared Gordon got robbed. He didn't get robbed. It was a very close fight. It was 1-1 going into the third. 
and I thought it was very up and down, back and forth. Nazrat was winning at one point, and then Jared Gordon took over, and then Nazrat was like trying to come back, but Jared was still kind of winning the round. And I think at the very end, Nazrat narrowly, and he, I mean very narrowly, edged it out, at least in my scorecard. But it wasn't necessarily a robbery. It could have gone either way. I wouldn't have been mad. Nazrat, I think at the very, very end, he had a better demeanor than Jared Gordon. And I know that doesn't necessarily mean much to y'all plebes out there. But when it comes to judging, sometimes the demeanor of a guy kind of slowing down and breaking and one guy kind of pushing forward and taking charge of the round is enough, and especially in hometown territory. Come on now. Uh, what else happened here? Volkan Uzdemir. Let's not talk about Irish Johnny Walker. Now he's going to go back to the favelas. Uh, Shara Pama Magomeda, Shira. Yeah, I bet Tricoli because I thought he was going to, you know, put up a fight. He didn't put up a fight. Then Magomed, uh, Shira, that is, just kicked the shit out of him for a majority of the fight. Knocked him out. I even tweeted like, yo, it's starting to look like I might actually have a chance with Mackenzie Dern. And, you know, I might have a chance with Mackenzie Dern. Kelvin Gastelum, you know, he, uh, he, uh, he looked fine. He did not perform great. He won the fight very easily. You know, it is what it is. Daniel Rodriguez, he can go back with the homies. Volkov did his thing. I mean, Volkov, that's one of the major points that I try to make is like, hey, I don't think Pavlovich, like, it's hard to say because I know what I said. I said he didn't necessarily deserve to get skyrocketed up to the title, but it's hard to make that argument when he's knocking everyone out in the first round. But the issue is, along that way he never truly got fully tested after the initial not necessarily a stunt but i guess a stunt against overeem but overeem was like way more experienced and it kind of showed here where he just didn't have the composure to fight a guy with the style of volkov that giant fucking freak of a man with long arms and part of me is like maybe his Aryan programming didn't allow him to kind of hurt people with his similar skin tone maybe more Aryan than he was so you know, it is what it is. You know, if you if you bet that doesn't go the distance, I feel for you. But it, it's just, it is what it is. We didn't see this coming with Pavlovich. And then, you know, Volkov was very happy to beat his ass for three rounds. And then Robert Whitaker defeats Ikram Alaskirov. I picked Ikram. And it was what it was. If I'm being honest with you, though, I never would have expected Robert Whitaker, who hasn't really knocked anyone out in a long-ass time, to knock out Ikram. So this really did show that, you know, despite me saying, like, hey, Robert's got it in the bag, but something's telling me that it's going to be Ikram's night. I was kind of hoping that the Saudi prince was going to like maybe drug Robert Whitaker. Not necessarily hoping, but kind of expecting. I guess that didn't happen. So Ikram, you know, we found out that he doesn't like eating his supper cuts. Like his mother's like, you eat your supper cuts. He's like, no. Robert force fed it to him and he knocked him out. It's just kind of ironic. Not necessarily ironic. I guess so, right? The guy that was supposed to fight Robert knocks this guy out. Alaskirov with an uppercut, and then Robert fights this guy on short notice, knocks him out with an uppercut. Poetic almost, but yeah. Let's get started with the UFC 303 card. It is a doozy of a card, of course, being headlined by Conor McGregor. And on top of that, they've got a lot of short notice bouts, the co-main event with Pereira and and Jerry too. It's going to be great. Uh, we've got the return of the Eagle, Brian Ortega versus this hybrid Mexican Brazilian beast Diego Lopez uh, top to bottom I think this is a great card and it's going to be a great night for everybody especially because Connor's bringing in that massive gate so I am thrilled to talk about this but before I talk about the fights I did want to mention that I do have a sponsor and that sponsor is well let me read it to you um, it, it's meant for two people because I'm doing this alone. I'm going to read it myself. But um, hey, do you ever feel the need to connect with someone? Connect with someone the similar way that Conor McGregor connects that left left hand shot? Yeah. Well, buddy, you are in luck. If you ever feel the need to connect with someone, for example, like the GOAT Conor McGregor, you can always rely on him 24 hours a day if you call 1-800-888-3665. Again, 1-800-888-3665. 1-800-888-FOOK. You can talk to Conor McGregor, impersonators, any time of the day. 
They will talk to you. They will tell you everything you need to know about Connor updates. Or if you're feeling frisky, they can get down with you as Connor impersonators. I mean, I'm not uh, ashamed to say it. I did meet a, a lovely lady uh, that was attached to this, uh, this line, and we kind of hit it off a little bit. But, uh, well, it kind of went awry. Let me show you a clip. Oh, hey. Oh, hey, what's up? Hey, um, off the bat, let me hear you say something that a true Connor fan wants to hear. Oh, you want to know something? Connor would have knocked out Tyron Woodley. Would have made him a triple champ. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, keep going. Oh, you want to put your stick in my mud? Oh, well, uh, uh, well yeah. Not the line, but I, it's pretty good. Oh, you want to hit me with that left nut shot? Uh, um, <clears throat> again, it's not the line. Can you, like, be a little bit more professional? Oh, you want to rest your balls on my forehead? All right, this isn't going to work out. Thank you. I give them credit for trying their best, but I would really like authenticity. So if you're going to mimic Connor's lines, they, they better be fucking accurate. I will call you out. But again, one eight 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 fook for all of your Connor needs. And I mean all of your Connor needs. But back to this card. UFC, uh, lordy. I, I just been calling it the, the Connor McGregor card, but UFC 303, uh, McGregor versus Chandler. And there are total 14 bouts with the first fight of the night. Let's break this baby down. And I'm giving you some good graphics because when it's a Conor McGregor card, your boy Johnny, or if you want to be a little bit more festive, Johnner, has to chill out. So I've got some nice graphics for you, which will be appearing when I start talking about the first fight of the night, which would be Ricky Simone versus Vinicius Oliveira. And the odds have it currently uh, minus 225 for Ricky Simone. Come back on Vinicius. Loca Dog Oliveira is plus 185 with Loca Dog, who is a Brazilian gangster. And I think really, if you've ever seen like City of God uh, with the Brazilians in, in the favelas, like this guy is all about that life. And we saw what he did in his UFC debut where he knocked out Sopaj or whatever the fuck the guy's name is. But what I enjoy about the guy is that he's a very fun personality and you know, I, I think he tries to emulate Connor a little bit, so I give him props there. But when it comes to this matchup, I think it's a tough matchup for him. I think it's a tough matchup for both men, mainly because what we saw with Oliveira in his UFC debut were a much smaller man and Sopaj. Sopai, he's not Connor, doesn't matter. When he took him down pretty easily, nearly finished him, took his back. And that was a sm much smaller man. Give me a second while I take a sip. And when I go back and watch his regionals, and I mean, I went back and watched a lot of his regionals to kind of refresh me. I think the issue with this kid is that he he's not mature enough yet. Not necessarily for the UFC, but I think for Ricky Simone, I'm not I'm not saying he's going to lose, but I'm just giving you my thoughts on him. When he came into the UFC, I was like, yo, this guy better put out Sopaj early to make a statement. If not, it's going to be tough. And he made it tough on himself, right? He let this kid kind of take rounds from him, take him down, dominate him, and then he ended up finishing him late, which it was promising because we saw that he had decent enough cardio to go, you know, push forward in the third round. But I go back and watch tape on this kid. He's got title fights and he's getting knocked out. He's getting dropped. He doesn't necessarily have the best chin nor necessarily the best output. But the guy, when he goes, he goes. That's what I really do like about Vinicius, and he's also pretty damn big. He's six foot nine compared to the six foot, or I'm sorry, five foot nine compared to the, the, the five foot six. These are both midget guys that Connor would easily destroy. But for Ricky Simone, minus 225, it's, it's an interesting bout for him because I think that Ricky could knock him out. I think Ricky can uh, grappling. I, I think Ricky could dominate this kid if he gets the ball rolling and what I mean by that is I think Ricky if he doesn't get takedowns if he doesn't establish himself as the better fighter meaning that if he gets out boxed by Vinicius and he gets his stuff his takedown stuffed it's going to be very easy for Vinicius to beat his ass and easily decision him or possibly knock him out along the way if Ricky doesn't get his momentum going early 
I always see this happening. Like when you see the Rob Fonts fights where Rob is just picking them apart on the outside and Ricky can't take him down. Uh, right recently with Mario Batista where he couldn't really do all that much where he still kept fighting. I'll give him props for that. He tried to win. It was really close up until a certain point. But when Ricky can't get the wrestling going, which I think in the third round he actually slammed him. But if he can't get that going and he's getting picked apart, he tends to kind of lose these fights. So it's a really tough matchup because I do think Ricky Simone can beat Vinicius easily. He's a much better fighter between both of them. But with Vinicius being so athletic, I do think that if he practices his takedown defense and that's all he's really training, uh, learns to kind of let the hands go a lot earlier, be a little bit more confident, less cocky. He played too much sometimes with, the, with, with, his, with his food. I think he's got a good chance here. So it's a very good live betting situation for Vinicius. If you see him stuffing early takedowns and Ricky's kind of getting a little, uh, I don't know, like a little, uh, how would you say, frustrated? Yeah, let's go with frustrated. And he's kind of lunging in. He still has a good chance to knock out Vinicius if Vinicius is playing around. So I think I'll stay away from this matchup. But the safe route for me, I do have to go with Ricky to win this fight. I think if he can get the wrestling going, he's a big boy. He's a big, strong boy. And he doesn't necessarily need the wrestling to win. He can knock out Vinicius as long as Vinicius doesn't knock him out first. And I, I think both of them are kind of chinny. But realistically, I think Ricky has fought much better competition. He's been hit much harder, especially with Song Yudong hitting him. And he was able to still persevere. And I didn't think he even got knocked out out cold. But what did get knocked out is the people at the casino when I cashed out that ticket on the inside, the distance on Ricky, or not Ricky, but on um, on, on uh, Song Yudong and plus money on him money line. But yeah, I think this is a good fight for Ricky to come back, kind of beat this kid. It's a very much a good opener because mo most likely one of these two guys is going to get finished. And it really propels people to try to buy the card even though they don't need to because Connor is going to be on it and he's going to sell out regardless. But tentatively, because I do think both of these guys have their issues, it's just the, the taller man, super athletic, who can be a little bit of a dunce versus the established grappler wrestler who's strong on top, good jujitsu, can knock dudes out with his power. But if he if he feels a little bit of like, oh no, things aren't going my way, let me just be a punching bag for the next three rounds, that's what I worry about Ricky Simone. So I will pick Ricky. I'm going to actually pick him by by knockout in the second round. If he can get on top of this kid, I think he can do some serious damage, possibly finish him with, with submission. But I think it's a good live betting situation. And roughly, if I were to say, uh, let's go Ricky Simone versus Conor McGregor, Conor would knock him out very, very quickly. I would say in the first round. And uh, I, I think he would actually retire, Ricky. Ricky would go back to, like, picking oranges or whatnot. Vinicius, on the other hand, I think Vinicius would, you know, I think Connor would kind of let him off the hook a little bit because Connor would be like, hey, I like your style. You're, you're trying to be like me. So he wouldn't knock him out that quickly because, like, for example, he'd knock out Ricky, like, within the first, say, 28 seconds. Vinicius, though, he'd give him a little bit of props. He'd kind of play with him a little bit, knock him out in the second round. Doesn't want to hurt the kid. But, you know, he would knock him out. And then uh, next bout we've got here at Flyweight, we've got Carlos Hernandez. Before I even say anything, he'd knock both these kids out in the first round, no problem. But Carlos Hernandez versus Rhea Tetsura. We've got Hernandez at plus 310. All right. And then Tetsura minus 400. Well, when doing research on this fight, one might call me a Carlos Hernandez simp because I actually think he's got a lot of promise, but... Damn, they always make this hard on me. Like they're feeding Hernandez to these Japanese prospects, and in this case, it's a nine and zero prospect and Tetsura, who's got I think a purple belt in jujitsu. He's got a good wrestling background. I think junior Olympic wrestling is what I, all I heard during the road to UFC. And the guy is good. He's he's an absolute standout. He's a stud with the wrestling. His striking's kind of shit. He does seem to gas out. He's only been to a decision once where he actually fought and beat a good guy. And uh, what the hell was his name? Kamako? Klimenko? Where did he go? Mark Klimanko. I think he joins out of AKA. He's pretty good. He's a pretty good wrestler. The issue is that with this kid, I am worried at these at this price tag, mainly because he's minus 400, obviously, and he's not necessarily been proven. He's, he's definitely shown that he's a solid guy. He can get on top, he can submit you, he can TKO you, he can relentlessly grapple. He does slow down. 
His hands are kind of shite, which again leads to Connor being able to knock him out early and easily. And on top of that, I do think he has gas tank issues where despite the fact that in that fight with Mark, he did gas out and Mark was having a much better round, he was still able to take his back and win the third round and win pretty dominantly. Hernandez, I think he's good with the boxing. He's got good jujitsu. He's got good everything. He's a solid, well-rounded fighter that he can do it all. The issues that I, as much as I like that, and I call him Mexican Frankie Edgar for that reason because he's so reminiscent of Frankie who bitched out and never fought Connor. But what was fascinating about Carlos is that he does remind me of him so much. It's just that he doesn't have, at least in my eyes currently, because I've always been a fan of him. I've literally picked him almost every single time to beat everybody, even the last guy in, in Tyra, where I thought like, hey, extend this. You might be able to beat him. But I don't think he's got it in him because he's so good everywhere. He's not great anywhere. That makes him stand out where even though his wrestling's good, I still think that guys like Tetsura can take him down and grapple him. And that's why I'm worried about him. I, I think he's worthy of a of a play. And to me, this is like a dog or pass or all around pass. I will bet Hernandez because I can't break the spell. I mean, like I'm going to do it every time. The issue is that if this does get extended and he does stuff the takedowns of Titsura and he does make him work and he survives and makes it into the later rounds, like late round number two, round number three, he can start investing to the body, slow this kid down, make him start like missing badly and finish him late or just beat him by a split decision. I, I think this reeks of split decision pretty badly. And I am going to pick Tetsura because I do think that despite that limitation that he has in his well-roundedness in MMA, that one thing that he has, the, the grappling, the combination of the wrestling and the jujitsu, the back takes, is just marvelous, is good enough for him to edge out a decision win here. I think he can also finish Carlos Hernandez early. He's had issues in the past, kind of giving up the back and getting choked out, especially by, you know, what was his name? Uh, Nascimento. But then again, Nascimento's a huge guy, and he, he's been fighting these huge giants in Tetsuro Tyra and Nascimento, and now he's fighting Tetsura here, and he's five foot six compared to the five foot eight. He's finally fighting like a smaller dude, so I'm wondering how well he's going to perform here. For a guy much like his size. So I think it's a dogger pass for me. I will pick Tetsura just because like I, I am leaning away from Carlos being a guy that could overcome these talented young folk to now kind of being like more of a middling guy that although he's talented, he just cannot overcome that hump. So I will go with Carlos Hernandez to probably lose that split decision to Tetsura Tyra, even though visually it might look like he won. Next bout, Andre Arlovsky versus Martin Boudet. Boudet has been kind of putting in work. I know he's been training with Aspinall for a bit. And after that absolute embarrassment against that <laughs> mongoloid Gadziev, it's it's do or die for me for Boudet. Because Boudet, I've always thought he was pretty talented. He's had good cardio, a good big body, black belt in jiu-jitsu. And he's been just be running through these like middling heavyweights. Um primarily Josh Parisian, but everywhere else, he's kind of been mid, like he's been beating some guys. He's had close fights with others. And for Arlovsky, the issue with Arlovsky is that he's developed that style of do the bare minimum and try to Arlovsky point decision a fight away from your opponent. And that could go well or it could go poorly. I know Budai's been working on his boxing for sure. I, I've seen the Instagram pics of him. His arms are looking good. He's still kind of fat, but he, he's putting in the work. And this, to me, is a fight for Budai. He is minus 260. I'm sorry, minus 280. It's hard to see with sunglasses at night. And uh, for the 45-year-old Arlovsky, he's plus 225. Arlovsky can always win a grimy split decision, but if Budai pushes forward, does his thing, gets him against the cage, clinches him up, lands to the body... I just think he's the much obviously younger dude. He's 32 years old. His body's in better condition. He just needs to perform, and he's going to win this fight by either knockout or a pretty clear decision. I will pick him by second-round TKO. I think he invests in the body with the knees to the body that he does so well. He just needs to be more confident in his hands and just run through him. Do not fall into that Arlovsky trap. If it, it does happen that Budai is kind of like, oh, no, I'm... I'm being a moron again, because <laughs> he could have ran through Gadzia. He just needed to be a lot smarter, and <laughs> he just let him kind of rubber him up, if you know what I'm saying. 
yeah, Orlovsky, he's always going to be a guy that can squeak out a decision. It's just that lately it's not been working, and he's just slowing down. He's still got a lot of good reflexes for heavyweight. He, he's mostly a fainter at this point. He throws a lot of feints to kind of discourage his opponent to move forward because it's still Andre Orlovsky, and he still has power. But if Budai just kind of tucks his chin, goes forward, clinches him up against the cage, I think he can do some damage early, slow him down, and maybe take him down. I think if he gets him to the ground, he's got a good chance to possibly submit him or do some pretty serious ground and pound. This is truly Martin Boudet's fight to lose. He just cannot be dumb about it. Like, you just overcome that embarrassment that you had against Gadziev. I think he can win this fight pretty easily. So I'm going with Budai by second round knockout. Now, if we're talking about how Connor would fare against both of these guys, number one, like, I, I hate to say this because Connor would hit Arlovsky so bad that. I think you'd put him into a retirement home. For Budai, I think that Budai's chin is pretty good, and it might actually take two Connor left hands to knock him out, but ultimately he'd get knocked out. And after Budai, I would say he, he would eat the first shot, and then like maybe 30 seconds later, he'd eat the second shot, and then Connor would just feel bad because he's doing the chicken dance, and then he you know passes out from you know getting hit so hard. So... Budai, I give him some credit. I think he can eat at least two of those shots. Next bout, we've got Michelle Watterson versus Jillian Robertson. Boy, howdy, how this fight is absolute trash. Minus 200 for Robertson, which is a joke to me. Um, did I say Robertson? Robertson, not Watterson. Minus 200. Come back on Watterson Gomez. I do not ex- acknowledge that Gomez, by the way. It's Watterson is plus 165. This is could be a very good retirement fight for Michelle Watterson if she ends up winning this fight. I think she's capable of winning this fight. She's on a four-fight losing streak, but she's fought like the very who's who. Marina Rodriguez, you know, Amanda Lemos, Pinheiro. Ah, some say people, people say that Pinheiro won or uh, that uh, Watterson beat uh, Pinheiro. I don't say that, but I think, uh, yeah, it is what it is. And then uh, Marina Rodriguez just utterly destroyed her her last fight. She's always been talented. She's always had the good striking. She's always had the good jujitsu. Probably a little undersized. She used to be an atom weight, if I recall correctly. I actually saw her fight live against Jessica Penne years ago when I was a wee tyke. Pre Connor. This is all pre Connor. If we're going to judge everything, like pre year of, uh, of our Lord Connor McGregor, uh, 2013, it was before that. And yeah, it was, a, it was a fun scrap. She ended up winning that fight. So I always have uh, Michelle Watterson like high in my like ranking of MMA women for obvious reasons. She is super hot. She's a banging bod, super hot milf. Jillian Robertson, she is literally one of my least favorite fighters in the UFC. I, I just every time I pick her, she loses. Every time I pick against her, she wins. I, I can't I can't gauge her because she's just so one dimensional for me. If she can't get a takedown and she's forced to strike, she's got nothing. And if she can get a takedown and she can control you there, she's probably gonna get a submission or pound you out. And she's made some improvements over the years, but when I see that fight against Baby Shark, whose name is escaping me, Tabitha Ricci, that was in no way a uh, throwing shade at Tabitha Ricci by reaching for my lady boy mug. But with Tabitha, (laughs) she just absolutely froze. Like, Din Thomas was like... Yeah, she's not uh, following the game plan that uh, that we, uh, yeah, it just, it's one of those nights, you know? And those nights tend to happen quite a bit. I'm just going to ignore this fight. Connor wouldn't care. Connor wouldn't hit a woman. And I would not uh, want to judge this fight. But if I'm going to be honest, I just cannot pick Watterson to, I'm sorry, I cannot pick Robertson to win a fight against someone who's competent enough. I think Gomez is good off of her back. Did I just acknowledge the Gomez? Damn it. Watterson is good off of her back. I think she can get back up. I think if, if Robertson is forced to strike, she's not going to like it. And it, it could just be a very like grimy fight where in reality, Robertson should just get on top and dominate her, take her back, choke her out. You know, Watterson's been choked out quite a bit of times, but does it really matter? <laughs> It's a women's MMA bout. Like, this, to me, does not belong on this card. This should have been ixed, nixed, exnade. But I will go with uh, Watterson by a decision. What is my logic? Because it doesn't matter. Next bout, we've got Peyton Talbot versus Yanis Gamori. And this, to me, is kind of the one of the easier fights. Like, it's very obvious based off of the, 
the odds minus 1600 for Peyton Talbot, which is like unplayable. You can't you can't play Talbot. And uh, come back in Gamori is plus 800. So I'm not the biggest Talbot supporter. I'm not a big fan of his, but it's hard to deny that he's got really good qualities, especially for this bantamweight division. Gamori, uh, he he did fight William Gomez. He had a he had a decent fight with him, and then he got hit to the body, balls, whatever you want to call it. I say that because the referee couldn't distinguish which was which, but ultimately he lost via TKO when he got hit to the balls. But when I see his regional tape, he's a serviceable fighter. He's a good point fighter. He's good everywhere. He just doesn't have really anything to threaten Talbot, and that's crazy to say. As much as I kind of dislike Talbot for being a Tal butt, he has a lot of good qualities in the sense that his chin seems to be untouchable, which is baffling to me. He, he eats shots so often, and it just does not phase him, and I don't understand how. It's like, what is he made out of? He has really good reflexes, really good timing, really good power in his punches, good wrestling, good submissions. You know, he can get out-wrestled for sure by a much better wrestler because he prefers the strike, but he's got the cardio to kind of keep going forward. He's going to run through Gamori, I believe. Gamori, his only chance is to win a very point-oriented kickboxing matchup, maybe mix in some takedowns. But ultimately, I don't think Gamori has any sort of really firepower to do anything to tell but to discourage him we saw what he did to that poor kid in Simon I thought Simon who is I, I thought he's a much better fighter he ran through Simon in a way that I've not seen since I visited that prison back in 1998 I was like wow he's running through him as for Gamori again like he's a serviceable guy I think he can get fights in the UFC and win them but the problem is he's fighting a guy that I don't think he's going to be able to hurt and the odds reflect that it, it's so disrespectful to him that I think the only way he wins this is via suicide vest but I think that the, again you can't play Talbot you have to take him by inside the distance or whatever or just don't bet him don't even put him on a parlay just in case he like something goofy might happen just because he hasn't lost yet doesn't mean he's not going to I think there's going to be certain fighters that are going to take advantage of his style I think there's going to be a day that, that some guy has a lot of power that's going to really hurt him Right now, though, I don't think that's Gamori. So I will go with Talbot. I'm going to take him by knockout in the second round, just mainly because I I think Gamori is just going to be tossing and turning little kicks here and there, maybe a couple punches to the body, and Talbot's going to land something stupid as fuck, maybe a spinning wheel kick, 360-degree wheel kick, and knocks him the fuck out or just severely hurts him, and then he submits him or something. Like it's Just the dumbest shit's going to happen in this fight. Or he's going to try that shit, and he's going to fall and then, like, break his ankle. I just can't trust Talbot at these odds, but I do think he's going to win this fight. As for Gamori and, and Talbot, how they fare up against Connor, you know, Gamori, <laughs> he's not even going to show up. He's just going to forfeit. Talbot, I'll give him credit. I think Talbot will get the respect of Connor because, like, hey, I like his style. But ultimately, I think Connor, out of mercy, because, like, I think out of mercy, he would head kick him. He would head, head kick knockout Peyton where he would knock him out cold, but had he hit him with that left-hand shot, he would never be the same. He, he's a company man. The UFC and Conor are, t are tight. They know they have a bit of a star here with Peyton Talbot, and Conor doesn't want to ruin it by like ending the kid's career with the left-hand shot. So I think he would head kick him, cause a lot less damage in the left-hand shot, but ultimately he will perish via the left-hand shot had he landed it. So... I will still go with uh, Connor to knock him out. Round-wise, I, I think I would say round number one, but like two and a half minutes in because he'd be like, ah, oh, this kid's fun. He's doing funny stuff. He's acting kind of like he's like me, but ultimately he just set up the head kick and knock him out. Next bout, we've got uh, Charles Jordan versus John Silva. Lord Silva versus Air Jordan. It's a great little fight at, at uh, featherweight here. John Silva plus 110, which is uh, <laughs> that's money, baby. <laughs> that's really good money. Uh, against Charles Jordan, who is minus 130. I, I find it fascinating that Jordan is still the, the favorite here. It might change pretty quickly, but if I'm going to be honest, I'm going to run through this one. I like John Silva in this matchup mainly because I think he has the firepower, the reflexes, the speed. He trains out of a good camp. I, I dislike sometimes that he doesn't throw a whole ton, but when he selects his shots, they are impactful and they are fast. This guy will download data for a brief period of time, and then he will start going. And what I like about John Silva is that he 
he knows and he believes in his power so much that he could be losing a round just based off of like him not throwing too much, based off of lack of volume. And then when he finds his shot, he knows he's going to hurt his opponent. He's going to stumble. And he's going to lay a bunch of punches, whether they're going to take him out or not. And he's going to win that round. And he doesn't necessarily tire. I, I really like this guy, Silva. I think his last fight against Gomez was going to be a really rough f- fight for him because Gomez, uber athlete, super tall, big f- featherweight. He would have just kind of danced around. And I think John Silva would have kind of bum-rushed him. And I, I just think that uh, Gomez would have been able to get away from him. Jordan, on the other hand, he ain't that smart. Jordan is a guy that perpetually, perpetually, pro, pro, uh, constantly drops the ball. He is getting better. He has good hands. He has ever improving jujitsu with the submissions black belt i believe but i just don't trust him i mean every time he fights a, a striker i i expect him to do well but he often doesn't like his last fight against that giant uh that giant st louis mongoloid guy uh woodson he, he edges him out to a split decision but that was kind of a cursed night but he didn't look all that great like he could have done a lot more against um nathaniel wood nathaniel wood that's the fight where i mostly taped him wood was hurting him left and right with that right hand and i think if john silva lands that punch it's going to really hurt him and he's he's slightly no there's they're the same reach he's going to be at a slight height disadvantage i don't think that's going to matter i think john silva is just the much more physical guy the other thing i like about john silva in a psychological aspect of him if i'm going to break it down psychologically he used to be a fat boy he used to be a really big fat boy fucking phone motherfucker anyways that'll get cut he used to be a fat boy and i think he mentioned that like yeah i used to be in a wheelchair and people made fun of me all the time and i think he harbors that that resentment that anger and you kind of see it every time that he fights so i do like that about him that he's kind of like uh damaged in a way that makes him fight super aggressive and he really wants to hurt people so he's got that bit of a sociopath to him on top of that he's fighting with the fighting nerds good camp for him i really like silva here i think he's going to win a decision I don't think he'll put away Charles. If he does knock out Charles, if he knocks out Charles, Jordan, holy shit, put the rocket to this kid. Because Charles never been finished that way with strikes. He's been choked out before. But damn, if he knocks out Charles, that's something special. But yeah, I think it's going to be an honest fight where Charles, he's got the hands, but I think in the pocket, John Silva's a little bit more comfortable. He's going to be throwing the harder shots, and he's going to win this one by decision. So as to how they would fare against Conor McGregor, he knocked them both out. At the same time, with the same punch, you just line them up and ba-ba. So they're featherweights. To him, they're midgets. He, he's he's a, he's a 170 now. He's 185. Shit. I didn't even mention that. They're fighting at 185. 185 Connor is just too much. Yeah, next bout, we've got Cup Swanson versus Andre Feely. Uh, Hans Moman over here. Cup Swanson. He is 40 years old, and he's trying to still win in the UFC. Granted, he did win a fight against Hakeem Dawadu to his last fight, but the dude at, at featherweight, you know, that's, that's a much better place for him, for damn sure. It, it's just that he's he's hard to kind of gauge sometimes. Like He's got great boxing. He's got the jiu-jitsu background. I think that's his main base was BJJ black belt, and I always joke about him being one of the worst black belts in UFC when he's getting submitted by Frank Edgar and everyone he's just everyone submitting him left and right and he's fighting Andre Feely and what's interesting about Feely is that he's got a similar trajectory to Cub Swanson you know very respected veterans good everywhere but they can never get over that hump uh, the thing with Feely he's just gonna be the younger guy 34 years old he's the much taller guy five foot eleven compared to the five foot eight of Swanson four inch reach advantage for touchy Feely and very simply, man, I, I can't go against Feely here. He's he's minus 190. Is he bettable? No. He's known to kind of shut the bet himself. Recently got knocked out. Tends not to really discourage him. He, he, he comes off of knockouts, and he still comes back and wins fights. And with both of them, we look at their, their records. Like on Tapology, we have for, for, you know, Cub Swanson. He's got a win, loss, win, loss, win. Okay? So he's due for a... A loss. Andre Feely, loss, win, loss, win, loss. He's due for a win. So using science, Andre Feely wins this fight. I think it could be a very honest fight where they go back and forth, but ultimately Feely needing this fight, needing to win, being less frail, not being a punching bag, literally and figuratively for Conor McGregor calling him Hans Molman. 
I, I think that Andre's got this one. I, I think he's just going to be the much longer guy. He just needs to be very safe. Do not get into a brawl with Cub Swanson. Just pick him apart on the outside. Kick his legs. You know, we saw how Jonathan Martinez kicked the shit out of his legs, but that's Jonathan Martinez. Andre Feely, I think he's a lot easier to kind of catch with the with the punches. So it could be a very fun back and forth fight. It could even be fight of the night because it's two guys at very similar style. Nothing particularly great specifically about either guy. But ultimately, I think Feely pulls it out. I think if he mixes and takedowns, being the much more physical of the two, I can't see Feely losing this fight unless he truly does something idiotic. So I'll go with Andre Feely to win this fight by a decision. <sighs> Connor would not punch Cub Swanson because he, he he's made a he's made an agreement with the courts that he would not touch the elderly anymore. As for Andre Feely, oh God, the issue with Feely, why Connor would not hit him, is because knowing uh, Connor, knowing Feely's like history with getting knocked out, he doesn't need a murder charge currently. Okay, the, he doesn't want to jeopardize this fight, so I think Connor would pass these two men. He would spare them. Great Saint Connor. Next bout, middleweight bout, Joe Pfeiffer versus Mark Andre Barrio fighting at 185. Connor's weight division. <clears throat> Mark Andre Barrio, power bar, plus 210. Come back on Joe, body bags, Pfeiffer is minus 265. So, Joe Pfeiffer, some might say he cooked. Others might say that he was rushed too, too quickly against Jack Hermanson. All that matters is that I cashed Jack Hermanson. As for Joe Pfeiffer, though, the issue with Joe is that I do think he did get rushed up a little too quickly. He also bought into his hype a little too quickly. He was just trying to knock people out. And then mm, he kind of had some stumbles. And by that, I mean it was that fight. He, he won that against Abdul Razak Al-Hassan. But you can kind of tell that he was not comfortable in that fight. And he had to take him down. He ultimately choked him out, which was, to me, one of the funniest chokeouts ever because I, I always stress idiots do not tap. Do not punch tap out. You... <laughs> You got to tap out with an open hand. And then what did what had happened afterwards? Like he started shimming and shaking. I was like, you moron. Like that's why I don't like it when dudes tap that way. Because it doesn't look like a tap. You're going to get choked out. You're going to lose more brain cells. We don't need that. Especially on a Connor card. As for Mark andre Barrio, you know, I used to think something about Barrio in the past. Like he's getting better. Yo, he's going to be beating certain guys. But ultimately he hasn't been doing that. I thought he was going to beat. Chris Curtis, and while I do think that was a very close fight that, you know, a different environment, he could have won it because it was so back and forth, but maybe Curtis was landing the cleaner while the volume was Barrio. It kind of made me think, like, maybe Barrio has a cap because all of his wins have not been via the most impressive opponents. Jordan Wright, of course, but he loses to Anthony Hernandez, who, you know, he's been running through everybody. Now Connor, though, and then Julian Marquez, you know, that, that fight kind of dropped in socks. I thought Marquez was looking good against him until he gassed out, and then we saw what Zachary Reese did to the boy. Heavenly father. And then um, Eric Anders. I mean, Eric Anders lost a round to Jamie Pickett, for God's sakes. Come the fuck on. And then Chris Curtis, who... You know, I like Chris, but there if you can't beat Chris Curtis, if you can't definitively beat Chris Curtis and it's you you're not gonna really propel yourself to that to that next level. As for Joe though, he did go five rounds with Jack Hermanson. He did beat Jack Hermanson for two rounds. Had that been a three round fight, that would have been swept under the rug. He did slow down. I think that was mostly an issue with him pacing himself with his with his confidence kinda waning because he couldn't knock him out of there, but he was just so physical. He does have the, the jiu-jitsu background. I think this is a very easy fight for Joe Pfeiffer if he makes it easy for himself in the sense that, like, if he decides to... Uh, if he decides to try to bang it out with Marc-Andre Barrio, that's the dumbest thing you can do. Definitely try to knock him out, but try to take him down, obviously, and work him on the mat. Like, it's not going to be easy. Like, Marc-Andre's got some decent you know cardio he's got some decent everything but if you do that if you mix things up use your strengths joe pfeiffer it's gonna be an easy night for him you know i think he can knock him out allegedly he's got african power in those punches more power than Nganu. and then now it's like you know poetan has more power just magically like what happened to joe pfeiffer's shit anyways i think joe pfeiffer 
he needs this win. It's a tough matchup for him in the sense that if he fights like he tried to fight Hermanson, I think that's exactly what Mark Andre wants. He wants to sap your power away, and then come the third round, he does kind of push the pace and try to sap you of your energy, maybe try to finish you. But Joe, I, I think he fought am, uh, admirably, admirably. He fought to the best of his ability against against Jack Hermanson, so I can't take that away from him. Like I, I thought, despite the loss, he handled himself well. I didn't necessarily like, like, oh, he got poked in the eye. He got punched in the eye. He's just kind of making excuses. But I think if he fights smart, he wins this fight. I will actually take him to win by a submission. I'm going to say round number two. I think on the feet, he's going to be a little too physical for Mark Andre. And if he does connect, he can knock him out. But I do expect this to be a smarter Joe Pfeiffer to go for takedowns. When he gets on top, work your jujitsu, work your ground and pound. Just make it an easy night for you, okay? But yeah, I, I like uh, Joe in this spot. Betting wise, not particularly, but I will take a break here before we get into the main card, primarily to discuss on my right hand side here. I've got a Conor McGregor signed pop figure by his number one impersonator. I couldn't actually meet Conor because he's so hard to find, you know, making movies and all this shit. So I found the next best thing, which was the number one Conor impersonator, and he impersonated his signature on here. So I was really happy with that because, you know, Conor's, I, I, he's just so hard to pinpoint i've been sending him letters and whatnot and you know he's going to respond eventually i know he will but god i need him to respond so bad but when he does i will you know throw that shit away get a get a brand new one even though this one's like the you know you can't buy it anymore it's like the ufc.com exclusive with the white shorts there's like three conor mcgregor pop figures which i will not bore you with the details now but there's like four hours of content i can make just about the Conor McGregor pop figures, the dethroned ones, which got, you know, dethroned. They couldn't use that anymore. The black shorts. But anyways, now to my left-hand side, I've got the uh, the Conor McGregor, like, smash buddy. And he has some talk, talk phrases, like, when you hit him, which I'm just going to touch his belly gingerly because I wouldn't want the, <laughs> the figure to hit me. You know what I'm saying? He talks. Say something, Conor. Thank you. I do look good. I know that. That is very true, Conor. But yeah, I will put him back here. Where he can rest, but he has got my back. I got two Connors in my back, and of course, I've got to represent the Irish people, the flag. So I've got Connor with me every time, everywhere. I even got this suit. Hopefully, Connor sees this. He can, like, you know, hey, Johnny, you look good. I'm like, oh, thanks, Connor. I know you do. You look great. Like, hey, three piece suits, of course. Yeah, you know, pocket watches. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't afford the pocket watch. I had to, you know, buy the suit. It's really hard to get a, a tailored suit you know, Irish color, so could not afford the pocket watch, you know, I, I mean, I would kill three people to get that pocket watch, but, you know, for three people to die making it, I could just not afford that on this salary, breaking even on UFC cards, could not do that, but yeah, let's move on to the main card where we've got Ian Machado Gary, oh, he's got a connection with certain someone, don't you think, versus Michael Venom Page, we've got Venom Page plus 100, come back on Ian Machado Gary, he is minus 120. He's fighting out of a specific uh, place, this Machado Gary, out of a certain country, if you will. Um, I will get into that a little bit later. But in this fight, we've got the 79-inch reach of Michael Venom Page. Obviously, he is known for being that point-style karate fighter versus Machado Gary, who is training out of, uh, <laughs> it says here, Kill Cliff, but he's training in Shooter Box in Brazil, which is why it leads me to say, you know, Ireland was not big enough for the two of them. So Ian Gary was asked to leave Ireland, and he's now in the favelas in Brazil, training with, the, you know, Charles Oliveira and Schudelbach. So, you know, good for the kid. Good for the kid. I'm not going to I'm not gonna shit on him, but he did the right thing. He, he left Ireland because, again, it's not his city. It's not his town, Dublin. It is what it is for him. But, yeah, props to him for doing the right thing and leaving Ireland. Uh, but yeah, six foot three for both men. What is fascinating about this fight is that it's it's such a winnable fight for either man. The odds reflect that. Now, when I look at this matchup, to me, it's like, hey, if, if Ian Gary is not ready for Michael Page, he's only lost twice. He's only been knocked out once. 
He's he's gotten better. I know he's up in age. He's 37 years old, but that speed is still there. He has developed good takedown defense over the years, good get-up game, and he can knock you out at any angle. He can throw spinning kicks. He can do all that crap. And if Ian Gary's not ready for it, and I mean Ian Gary is fast. I don't know if he's going to be faster than Michael Page. Like, they both have good kicks. Mostly Ian Gary's low kicks are good. His boxing good. His uh, Everything about him is very good, except his taste in women. But <laughs> when I mention everything is good, good boxing, good speed, good kicks, good high kicks, good low kicks, good middle kicks, good side kicks. Um, yeah, the guy, the guy can do it all. The issue is that he can't stay in one gym. He's had those issues in the past where he got kicked out of one gym. He went to Kill Cliff. He's no longer there. Now he's in Brazil. I don't know if it's by choice. Obviously, as I mentioned, he had to leave Ireland. But I worry about the matchup for Gary because I think he is more than capable of beating Paige. I think he's more than capable to match his speed. But with his last fight where he was kind of afraid of Jeff Neal, I don't know. This becomes another tentative fight where both men are just kind of like trying to pick their spots. That is a Michael Venom Page fight through and through where he can just leap in, dart in, catch Ian maybe hurt him like the thing is I always had this thought that Paige's chin was kind of crappy because he got knocked out pretty viciously by Douglas Lima and that's you know not the best take if you want to say that because Douglas Lima hit him with like the uppercut of the gods but my biggest issue is that if he does get his legs kicked out if you time that well which I think Gary has the ability to to time that lead leg when he's leaping in or to counter him as he's leaping in, I think Gary could catch him. If he can't do that, then it's Michael Page just picking him apart. It's such a tough matchup. It's a really good fight. It's a very, very good fight between these two guys because if Gary wants to try to implement some of his shooto box, which is hilarious, shooto box jujitsu, try to take him to the mat and kind of control him there, will he have ultimate success down there if Michael Page... Being the kind of fighter that he is, everyone wants to take him down. But not Conor McGregor, who just knock him out out cold. Conor doesn't play those stupid games. But if that's going to happen, right, is is he going to have success? Is he going to be able to take him down? Is he going to be able to get on top of him? Is he going to be able to land the low kicks? It's such a fascinating matchup. I think it's a very, very good fight. Again, very evenly matched. It should be a pick em with, obviously, a slight lean towards Gary. And here we've got plus money on page. It's kind of a dog or pass live bet situation. You know, I don't find Venom Page to have an ultimate shelf life for the UFC, but I do think he can really upset the apple cart here by beating Ian Machado Gary, taking his O. It's not the best thing for business, right? I think Michael Page can afford to get a loss. They can still build up Gary. But the, the skill set for Gary, I just I need to see it. I need to see what he's truly capable of. He's beaten some guys that he was supposed to beat definitively, and now he's fighting a guy who, you know, he fought for the Bellator title. He's fought really good competition. He's got years of experience. He's got years of experience getting better and knocking dudes out, dudes that ultimately could have beaten him. I think for me it's a it's page or pass, so I will – Go ahead and take Page by a decision here. I think he can point fight him. And I will say, when he fought Holland, some of the shots he landed on Holland, I think would knock Machado Gary out cold. It's just, again, if Machado Gary can time Page, and I think he's more than capable of doing it. I think that when he's darting in, he can have the reflexes to, like, duck his head out of the way, like just head movement and then counter effectively where he can probably catch and knock out Page. It's just we. I have to see it. I just. I rather stay away from it. I just rather enjoy it. <clears throat> In this fight, it's like a, for me. I have to go with the dog. I think it's again. <clears throat> excuse me. I need to drink more of my lady boy. Um. Yeah, I think that with these two, like I, I don't think you have a. Oh man, because I I don't think Machado's gonna knock him out early, and I don't think Gary's gonna. <clears throat> sorry, I don't think Paige is going to knock him out early or Machado is going to knock him out early. I think this goes a few rounds where they're figuring each other out with the speed and, you know, the darting in and out, the, the contrast and styles. So it, to, <clears throat> to me, it's kind of like an over, over one and a half. So it's, it's, I don't think you're on the wrong side either way. If you have a strong conviction in either or, I understand it. But to me, it's like I'd rather stay away from it. It's kind of a headache to try to break down. 
because this would have to happen for this guy to win and this would have to happen for that guy to win. So you have to see that live and then maybe live bet accordingly. But for me, dog or pass, I'd rather take the dog here. I'll take him by a <clears throat> decision here. As we already know, the common thing, you know, how would Connor fare with both of these guys? <laughs> he'd knock out, he'd knock out Venom Page. Um, I'll give Page some credit though. I think Page will be able to run around the cage for maybe uh, two rounds, just avoiding Connor, and then eventually, after you know they're, they're threatening his life, they're like, "Hey, if you do not engage with Connor and accept your fate, you know, bad things are going to happen to your family." Then at that point, because you know Connor has his own boys out in the, in the UK. I think that's when Paige would accept his fate and get knocked out. As for Machado, Gary, MIA. We have no idea because he he fled to Brazil, and Connor's not going to go back to that 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 country anytime soon to figure this out. So uh, I will give props to Gary for running for his life, as many of us would. So uh, it's kind of a, a null and void for Ian Gary because he he tailed it out of the country. But yeah, moving on. Another bantamweight ladies fight that does not matter. We've got Myra Bruno Silva, who just lost the bid for the title, which whoever the champion is, I blocked her out of my memory. I have no idea. For the love of God, do not post a comment of who it is. I do not want to remember. All I know is that Bueno Silva lost, and it was embarrassing, versus Macy Chesson, who, if I'm breaking this down easily, which I will, uh, I'm going to pick randomly. I'm going to pick Bruno Silva by a decision or a submission, I'm gonna say second round. Macy Chesson is not uber skilled. I think she's just huge. She's five foot eleven, seventy two inch reach compared to the five foot six, sixty six and a half inch reach for Bueno Silva. Bueno's a much better fighter, but she's gonna be undersized here. It is very simply put, either Bueno Silva gets a sub or lands good punches, good kicks with their Muay Thai. Or Chasson is just going to overpower her, lay on top of her, negate the the submissions from her. But damn, when I see the panic yans at fight number two against Chasson, and she's giving up takedowns to the kickboxer panic yans at, I'm like, get the fuck out of here, man. She even got th- kind of threatened by the armbar. It was not close, but if Bueno Silva gets her in that position, brother, man, I just I cannot trust Chasson. I think she's capable of winning this fight. The odds. Plus 160 for Chasson. Come back on Bueno Solo. Minus 190. This is an absolute pass of a fight. God, because they both like women, uh, Connor would not only take their women, but he would knock both of them out. No problem. But, yeah, I will go with Bueno Silva by a submission. Round number two. I think Chasson lays on her for the first round, and then Bueno Silva pops in one of her ADH deep hills in the corner. And then she gets back to like, oh, I can, I'm focusing again. Like the voices are gone. Oh shit, maybe I should not lay on my back. Hooray! She wins the fight, second round. Next bout, we've got Anthony Smith versus Roman Delice. Boy, howdy, what a fucking fight here! It was supposed to be a multitude of different fights. Jamal Hill versus Khalil Roundtree, and then Roundtree pulled out, and they got. Who the hell did they get? They got somebody. Who the actually let me let me break down that lineage because I am intrigued out of the wazoo as to the lineage. Carlos Olberg. So then Carlos Olberg takes the place of Roundtree. Then something funky happened to Jamal Hill that uh oh man. I've been living with this guilt for weeks now where I'm the reason Jamal Hill had to pull out. Jamal Hill was in town to judge. Not to judge, I'm sorry. I was judging a fight, and Jamal Hill came to corner a guy for a local fight night. And I saw Jamal. I said hi to him. Didn't, like, gush over him. Like, oh, you know. Just, you know, I, I wanted to feel the presence of Poetan, so I, I went and I'm like, hey, how's it going? So I'm doing my judgy-wudgy stuff. I'm sitting down, and final fight, he comes out to corner his man. And he's like, hey, you got it, bro, you got it. And he's walking backwards, and I see his buttocks just kind of closing in on me, and I don't have the amount of time to, re- to react. So my shoulder bumps into his posterior, and then he kind of stumbles, and he's like, he grabs his butt, and he's like, oh, oh, sorry, bro, sorry. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no worries. 
but I felt my shoulder kind of like do some damage to his rear. And then days later, he had to pull out of the fight. It's been eating me up alive, and I just wanted to, you know, break character for a second and uh, take this time to apologize to absolutely nobody. Fuck that. Let's talk about this horrible fight that happened because of me. But, yeah, we've got Anthony Smith now taking over for Jamal Hill fighting Carlos Olberg. And then Olberg pulls out, and then now we got Roman Delizze. Because we had an easy, sure thing with Olberg knocking out Anthony Smith. Because my ultimate, this thing here is like, hey, Anthony Smith cannot be highly ranked or highly, you know, good prospects. Well, I guess not all of them. I think he can be one of them. Petrino, but Petrino kind of left his head in there for him to get choked out. But I don't think that Anthony Smith could beat good light heavyweights I like I don't think he was going to beat Olberg I don't think he can beat a multitude of people he's not he clearly couldn't even beat Khalil Roundtree so now what they did is they got Roman Delice who is a middleweight and I do think Anthony Smith could beat a top level middleweight he just can't beat a top level light heavyweight yeah Roman fought at light heavyweight I know that but he's not a top level light heavyweight this to me this is Anthony Smith's fight to absolutely lose the odds do I even have the odds currently let's see if they are out because they are not listed on the topology i am very interested to know what these odds are going to be because oh shit here we go plus 120 anthony smith come back on deletes a minus 142 so i didn't think that was going to be the case i thought it was going to be anthony smith that was going to be the the favorite because i think he's just better than roman deletes a other than you know the the raw natural charisma to steal another man's woman, you know, Anthony doesn't have that, but Roman has that in spades so much. So Uh, he's got a good chin, but to me, this is like Roman's Roman's kind of a punching bag. If he cannot get his takedowns going, he can't get his leg locks going. He can't get, you know, the ball rolling, pressuring you. He he doesn't have the ultimate skill set to contend at the high level at middleweight, but he is, definitely a threat he's a danger he's just very good they're they're equal in size they're equal in height they're equal in reach they're dead even Uh, I think Anthony Smith is like two inches taller but to me Anthony Smith what I did like even though I picked against him against Petrino what he did well is establish a a really stiff jab which is very necessary I think it's going to be very beneficial here against Delite who will just be spamming hooks and he had a very solid low low calf kick he's been using that for a while now he hurt uh, that Aussie kid with the Resident Evil tattoo. I can't remember his name. Uh, yeah, he, he busted up his calf. Uh, Jimmy the Brute Crute. There you go. And then he did the same thing to Petrino. The reason why Petrino went full Hitardo was because those calf kicks were multi- like they were just adding up, which I thought was a big threat when I saw that early. I'm like, bro, like stop letting him kick your legs because the the moment he hit him, like. One after the other, that's when Petrino decided to actually go in, avoid the, the striking, and go in for the takedown. I think he panicked in that situation, and that led for him to actually get the choke. I do think Petrino, had he kept it on the feet, eventually would have knocked out Anthony Smith. Just too quick, too too virile, too young, too much of a prospect at light heavyweight. Right here, though, I think this is Anthony Smith's fight to lose. I think he should be the favorite. If that is the case, I might actually put a bet on Anthony Smith. I think he's got the power in his punches. I think he's got the jiu-jitsu to match the lead, say. Just avoid the leg locks. Dude, this, uh, this motherfucker's so nasty with the sweep. The way he did that to Jack Hermanson was absolutely incredible. But when I see him fight, and I saw the fight with him and uh, Imavov, and Imavov treated him like that punching bag, just keeping him at bay, kicking him, punching him, jabbing him. I think... Um, Anthony Smith has got has got the really good chance here to do the same. Just kind of keep him on the outside, use your power, and then maybe tr- don't don't really try to play the jujitsu unless you absolutely have to. But batter the kick, batter the leg that is with the with the low kick, and then I think he can win the decision here. Delete is really tough to to put away for damn sure. I think he might take some damage here. He took some damage. His last fight, I think this is a little too soon to be moving up. Definitely doesn't have to cut weight, so that's good for, for Delice. Would it be great if Delice knocks out Anthony Smith? 
it'd be fun, but I think this is Anthony Smith's fight to lose, and I will actually pick him to win by a decision. I, I think that he is going to be just too sharp, too much of a better striker, too many weapons to lose to Delice. I think the only way Delice wins by some miracle fluke, and I don't even want to call it a fluke because what he does is absolute skill. It's just when he throws his punches, they're not the cleanest. Uh, sometimes, like, I want to call it a fluke, but the way he he reversed Hermanson with that with that calf slicer esque move and then got on top. That was disgusting. But when <laughs> no one expected that to happen. But yeah, I think Smith is gonna pick him apart with that jab and the low calf kick. Next bout, Brian Ortega. Oh, before I forget, uh, he, Connor would fix Anthony Smith's nose so it looks less like a pig. And Roman Delice, uh Roman Delize would lose his women to Conor McGregor, which the saddest thing is, I don't even want to say it out loud, but let's just say that Roman Delize wouldn't make it to the fight because he would have, uh, oh, what's a good way to, he would have expired himself because of the absolute devastation of him losing that swagger that Conor just took away from him. Pulls up on his yacht to Georgia. He, they have a canal digged out for his yacht. Don't worry about it. Don't don't think of the the geographic schematics they have a yeah they'll they'll build something so connor can pull up his yacht to, to georgia and then the ladies are like oh my god that's connor mcgregor fuck you roman delete say we're leaving you and then you know roman poor roman but it, it's connor anyways brian ortega versus diego lopez at 145 very short notice fight brian t city versus jesus i don't even know what we would call diego lopez at this point like he's a massive massive featherweight he is five foot 11 72 and a half inch reach he's got massive power great jujitsu but there's some issues about diego that we have to be honest about same as for brian ortega i like both of these guys they both rep you know parts of uh, places that i like like diego lopez is repping mexico even though he's not mexican it's awesome i respect it he's he's repping the emo community i respect that too you know i like me some emo girls uh, Brian T. City's repping the, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, the, it's Los Angeles, L.A. That's where I'm from. You know, literally, like, he basically grew up together. I've told the story. He lived, you know, hop, skip, a freeway away. You know, never met, but best friends. T. City reps the city very well. He's got the jiu-jitsu background. He hangs out with the homies. He's got the long hair. Hard not to like Brian Ortega, like, I love me some Brian Ortega, uh, but if I'm being realistic about him, the homie Brian, he has been concerning me lately. I listened to his recent interview, and he's talking about, like, how he was motivated by money to take this fight, and granted, it's a short-notice fight, because I don't know why the UFC did that, honest to God. I don't know why they, like, hey, my guess is that they wanted to maximize the star potential with Connor being on the card, so they're like, hey, let's build up this kid who knocks people out in, in Diego Lopez and let's reward Brian Ortega for nearly decapitating Eric Rodriguez, which I'm a big fan of that. So it got kind of put together quickly, and Brian's just not quite ready for a fight. He was talking about like, hey, the real reason I took this fight was you know money. I, I want to donate hundred grand to some church, which is great. I respect that. It's just um, kind of worries me that he's not quite in his right headspace for this fight. I don't think he's been properly training. He specifically said that. He said he was going to move up to 155 because, like, his dreams and aspirations at featherweight are kind of on hold and, and frozen like John Luterbach. Um, for Diego Lopez, he's on a generational run right now. He's knocking everyone out, submitting everyone all within the first round. And I love that. I absolutely love it because he's living up to his full potential. <laughs> but when you go back and watch his regionals, this kid fucking sucked. He's going five rounds and losing split decisions to nobodies. He's getting absolutely dominated by, by uh, why why can't I remember his fucking name? Uh, nah, 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 nah. What the fuck is his name? <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, Joannis and Brito, there we go. And the Contender Series, Joannis and Brito just blast doubled him took him down and controlled him and despite him being super dangerous on the mat like if you're able to be crafty enough to see what he's pulling up arm bars triangles and shit 
Like if you got good jujitsu, you can lay on him, kind of beat him up. But you have to be very physical to do that. You have to be strong and be able to hold him down. But that was like back in the day. I'm like, you look at this kid and you see him fighting Molesvar. I'm like, yeah, Molesvar's going to lay on him for the majority of the fight. And that wasn't the case. It's like he's le- been leveling up. And since he lost in the Contender Series, he lost to some dude, uh, at, I think Cage Fury or some shit. He lost a five-round fight, which I thought he won. But it was, you know, it was too close for comfort. And it's like he didn't have his confidence at the time. He didn't have the confidence in the punches. He didn't have the absolute confidence to go full fledged for the for the submissions. But when he started like developing the punching power and just being more fluid with the punches and the striking and the boxing, that's when he gained that confidence and he's just running through guys. The fact that he went three rounds with Mozart Evloev on short notice hurt him bad, got him in pretty bad submissions, never quit on himself. I think that was the turning point for this kid where it's like, yo. I I'm, I can sense that this dude was like, yo, I'm not doing what I wanted to do. I got beat by Joe Anderson Brito. He took my ass down easily. He eventually poked him in the eye, but still, like, he wasn't doing great. And you can kind of sense, like, maybe his, his mentality's not there, but that's a night and day difference to now where he is letting them fucking hands go in the pocket, letting those uppercuts rip, just throwing everything with power, knowing that if he gets taken down, he can either get back up or threaten off of his back enough to make the dudes weary. I think his takedown defense has definitely improved. It's just more of the confidence, man. Like, you can see that the kid has the total package of punching power. He's got the jujitsu skills. He's just so spectacular. But what was the issue before? And I think the confidence is what, what it was. But I still think he is very much so the same fighter that if you do have a guy who is very good at wrestling, grappling, and lay on top of him, he could lose a decision. I, I think that if he loses concentration, he could lose a decision. In this case, though, I, I think he's got a very good chance to unfortunately run through Brian Ortega. Brian's a tough guy, man. Brian is tougher than a 50-cent steak or tougher than a $20 prostitute. They will stab you. Brian is that tough. The issue is that I do think he's taken a lot of damage. He was concerning the shit out of me. When he was talking in that interview, it was like, yo, like, hey, like, I'm finally healed up. I, I'm losing my prime. It's almost like he's desperate and he did not want to take this fight. He's talking about, like, hey, if, if Diego can get the job done, like, I feel at least okay that I propelled him up into a different stratosphere. And if I can get this done, you know, I'm good. But he, he just seems more calm. He seems happy. You know, I hate to bring this up, but when he, when he, when fighters do find religion and they find peace within themselves and they feel like, hey, I'm content, that extra edge that they need, I think it, it does kind of diminish. Like the Rory McDonald's when he found religion, not, like, I'm not trying to bash that, but it, it's like they don't have that killer edge anymore. And I, I don't want to think that about Brian until I see it because he definitely fought back we saw him fight back against the forces of evil for god's sake in his last fight in mexico against against jay rodriguez we all know tracy cortez was in the in the audience there using her magical voodoo juju and like poking his knees and shit that way he 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 jumped in the air and he would have twisted his ankle but like god and the eagle power spirit was with him that night and he overcame that he took a bit of an ass whooping but god has to test you sometimes but brian overcame that he took a rodriguez down beat the shit out of him choked him out beautiful i mean beautiful going back and rewatching that <sighs> there's so many things that bring me joy but nothing like a conor mcgregor card and, and a close second would be Yair Rodriguez getting absolutely demolished. It just makes me very, very happy. But with Brian Ortega, what is his path to victory, right? He has to keep it. He has to keep it not dynamic. If Diego Lopez starts letting the hands go with that absolute massive power, do I think that Diego can knock him out? Possible. Do I? But I'm not confident in it do i think that diego can hurt him oh boy 100 percent. i think he can hurt him in in multiple ways either hurt him where it wobbles him or hurt him to the point where he takes a lot of damage that again like i predicted with the rodriguez fight that hey as much as i hate rodriguez i think that he can do some damage to ortega where 
he just wouldn't be able to continue fighting at that level where he needs to to be able to do anything to really hurt um, Rodriguez. In this case, against Rodriguez, because he sucks so much and he's a bum, despite hurting him, you know, God, Eagle, Brian Ortega was able to still take him down and beat his ass. The issue is that I don't think Ortega's got the best wrestling game. I don't think he's going to be able to do much with Diego Lopez. If Diego, Diego would be his own worst enemy here is that if he jumps for guillotine or jumps for a triangle, it's very much possible that these two guys can submit each other. They, they both have great jujitsu. I think Ortega's got more legitimate fundamental jujitsu where he can set things up. He's just the cleaner of the two. He's just more fluid than, than Diego Lopez, but Diego's just more powerful. Uh, he is fluid as well, but just not as Ortega where he's also more capable of being a bit more creative with his submissions, where he would go for the knee bars and crank on them, go for these like transitions from armbar to triangle. Like T City getting caught in a triangle choke would be absolutely devastating, but you know T City landing the triangle on Diego Lopez would be awesome. But with Diego being just so physically big, just so physical, I think he he can manhandle the uh, Brian Ortega, and it, it sucks to say like I. I'm a big Ortega fan. Again, like we're brothers. Somos raza, somos sangre, right? We're 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 connected. We're we're Chicanos from the from El Barrio. But I cannot go against Diego Lopez right now with his run. Like it, it would really take a guy for me to say, yeah, this guy can take him down. He's not gonna get hurt. He's not gonna put hands on him. And I think he's gonna take Diego Lopez down easily and get some top control time. But I don't think that's Brian Ortega. I think Brian has a good chance to catch him with something. I, th- I think his boxing's definitely good. But with Diego Lopez having that mythical lady Mexican boxing that he's been developing, God have mercy on Brian Ortega. The issue with Lopez being so good in the pocket these days, just letting his combinations go, man, the, the way he's just hurting these guys is next level. And granted, these guys... Like Sadiq Yusuf and um, Pat Sabatini don't have a chin like Brian Ortega. My biggest worry about Brian is seeing him hurt here. And I'm not saying that like, oh my God, I'm so fearful that Diego Lopez is going to run through him. I just know that with Ortega's history, with his eyes getting busted up by Max back in the day, uh, I always worry like in the back of my mind, I have Josh Koscheck. When Josh Koscheck fought... GSP the second time and he broke his orbitable, orbitable, orbital bone, <laughs> orbital bone. He fought Matt Hughes. Matt Hughes was jabbing him to the eye and his eye was like puffed up. He ended up knocking out uh, Hughes, Matt Hughes, but um, it still is fresh in my mind. Like, hey, when you've taken that kind of damage to the eyes, they, they might get pretty busted up bad. So to me, I will go with Lopez. I'm going to respectfully go with the decision here. Do I think it could happen? Yes. If he beats Ortega for, for say, two rounds and then Ortega finally gets a takedown, it, it's just a tough matchup for me to break down, being so invested in both of these guys, if I'm being honest with you. Uh, I do like both. I want to see Diego really live up to that potential. And it sucks because he has to beat Brian Ortega to do so. And for Brian Ortega to, like, derail the hype train of of Diego Lopez, that would also kind of suck because, like, where would his confidence be then? So I will reluctantly pick Lopez to win this one by decision. I am considering betting him. Like, the line is plus 145. This is all dependent on what my interpretation is of Brian Ortega. I did not like what I heard in that interview. He just seems so, like, it is what it is. My my best days are behind me. I got to move up. You know, and I only took this fight for money. And he's almost kind of congratulating Diego Lopez and Diego's looking absolutely shredded he's been just training and he's obviously the younger dude here 29 versus 33 you know he's not old by any sense in Brian Ortega it's just with that accumulative damage hmm. it, it just is what it is I suppose but out of respect for both of these men I think uh I think Connor would pass these two men up he's like hey uh, Connor you know he respects the Mexican people he's like hey you know what I'm not going to knock you guys out. I'm just going to not uh, share my my whiskey with you. And I think that's that's punishment enough, you know. And I'm not, uh, like, I don't drink at all, but if I did, and it's probably for the best because I'd be just wasted on proper number 12 every day of the week 
was trying to be as close to Connor as possible. You don't want to know what I would do with that empty bottle. But yeah, I think uh, in this case, he, he respects both of these Mexican warriors, I guess partly Mexican for Lopez, so much so that he would not want to lay hands on him. He, he just wants to party with them, but no no proper 12 for either of these men. Punishment. Uh, co-main event of the evening, we've got the rematch. Alex Pereira versus Jiri Prohaska, the second great co-main event to ultimately cap off a great Conor McGregor card where Conor McGregor will be fighting Michael Chandler. But yeah, here we go. Alex Pereira versus Jiri Prohaska, too. Odds have it in favor of Pereira, minus 165. Come back on Prohaska, plus 140. What is crazy about this fight is the perception of Pereira, obviously, because that is the biggest factor in the odds and how we decide to bet this fight. When it comes to Pereira, we know that he <laughs> he he has the nasty left hook, nasty striking, sets things up beautifully, beautifully, and um, that low calf kick is absolutely dangerous for Prohaska. He is on paper, the much better fighter. He's got a solid ground game. He he's a tough, he's a tough Czech fighter, man. This dude with the spirit of the samurai, the ability for him to just move forward, just ignore conventional striking methods, and find a way to knock you out. He choked out Glover Teixeira with no hooks in the fifth round. And that's what's crazy about predicting fights sometimes. If I'm being honest, where if, if I were to say, like, hey, I'm going to pick, on a whim here, Jiri Prohaska to submit Glober Tejera, I don't know, I'm going to say the fifth round, just pulling it out of my ass, just because with it being MMA and anything is legitimately fucking possible, I'll just say that's very possible. I guarantee you everyone would be like, you're a fucking idiot, he's not submitting Glover Tejera, the multiple-time black belt, blah, 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 and then it happens, and it's like, oh my god. I never saw that shit coming, if I'm being honest. Like, not at all. I didn't think that was going to happen whatsoever. That's what Jiri brings to the table, that unpredictability where he can make the impossible possible. The dude lives the Bushido code, and when he beat the shit out of, out of Alexander Rakic, I was so 50-50 on that matchup. I went back and forth. If I'm being honest, I don't even remember who I picked to win, but I do know I actually bet Jiri to win live at plus odds, because I was like, Jiri, Jiri's the favorite, and then I'm like, oh, Rakic is the, the dog, I might actually bet Rakic, because I think he's just so much cleaner, but then I saw that Rakic became the favorite, I bet him like at plus 100, and then I saw that he became like a slight favorite, I actually cashed that bitch out, and then put the money on the dog in Prohaska, I was like, yo, I, I, I gotta wait to, to the second round to see what happens, but he was getting his leg chewed up, he, he was getting pretty much styled on early. He made Rakic look elite, world-class, and it was it was both concerning and amazing to see what he did, where he came back, he took so many leg kicks. He ate so many leg kicks so much so that I was like, wow, this guy is not going to be standing come the second round, but then I saw something in him. I saw what he did when he, he was eating those kicks, and it's called no-selling, meaning that he just sat he did not let them affect him he just said fuck your gay little kicks i'm gonna keep moving forward and i'm gonna hit you eventually and you're gonna go down and that's exactly what happened because rackage was still looking good in the second round but ultimately he hit him he caught him he's like fuck your leg kicks fuck your punches i mean rackage was landing clean shots that would have hit and hurt a lot of people in this division at light heavyweight but it did not hurt Jiri. He just ate him, and then when he had his opportunity, he beat the shit out of Rakic, which sucked because like Rakic was looking world class, elite level in that fight. But Jiri just said, "No, no, no, not today." And that's what's fascinating is that I think with Jiri having the experience with Poetan in the past, knowing that he's going to kick his legs, his legs can be tenderized. Watch out for that power. And knowing that Poetan's you know, ground game is his weakest aspect, I, I think a jury, a smart jury could win this fight. The only problem is he's fighting Alex Poetan Pereira, a guy who has been, I, f I feel as if with that last fight with Jamal Hill. And granted, I, I feel awful for picking against Pereira and betting against him. I really legitimately thought that 
that Hill was going to present a lot of issues for him. But what I saw in that fight was a new level of Pereira, a new confidence. When I saw Pereira, and I, this is 100% the God's honest truth, when I saw Pereira landing that left jab to the body, when he landed it consecutively on on Jamal Hill, I was like, shit, it's, it's over for Hill. Like the moment you let him establish that distance where he's gauging distance to the body to leap in with the left hook, that's when I knew like this is going to be not good for Hill. And then shortly after we saw what happened, Pereira is so limited in his overall skill set. Like he's got great kickboxing, but he's so limited everywhere else. Even though he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, it's just so incredible what he's been able to do in the UFC. He's not even been in the UFC for three years. I bring this up every time because I am a big Poetan fan. Like, huge. I, I, I keep bitching that I have a bunch of his merch. Not as much as I have Connor merch, but I have a bunch of his merch. You know, probably my second. If I'm being honest, he's probably my third favorite fighter. At first, it's Connor McGregor, and then it's Connor McGregor, and then it is Alex Poetan Pereira. The issue here for Jiri is that if he cannot, if he cannot let Pereira, let me rephrase that because I'm like I'm still, I'm still thinking about Connor and everything. But if Jiri allows Pereira to dictate the pace, to let himself feel more comfortable, the way he fought um, Jamal Hill, where he was just establishing distance, he 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 almost fought in the past, like in the. I'll tie back to this real quick, but when he fought John Blahovic, we saw that like, hey, he's not quite acclimated to the bodies in light heavyweight. He ended up winning a split decision there against Jiri. The same kind of thing, like, hey, I don't know what this guy brings to the table. Like, I'm not fully acclimated to light heavyweight in the UFC. He was a little tentative. He was landing beautiful shots. He's very patient with the low kick. You know, he, he caught him and he hurt him, and then at the end, he finished him definitively. With Jamal Hill. Him being like, yo, I've been putting in work. I've been trading with ladies, doing judo with Kayla Harrison. I got my, I'm working on my black belt in jiu-jitsu. That version of Poetan was absolutely fucking terrifying. Where he was like, yo, take my ass down. We'll see what happens. I'll get my ass back up. I'll lose a round. I'm going to knock you the fuck out. If we see that version of Alex Pereira where he is just so comfortable, so unafraid of getting taken down, where his striking is just so fluid and he's timing shit... I think he's going to knock out Jury Prasca pretty quickly within the first two rounds. If Jury does mix in some takedowns early and gets them successfully, he has to do damage to Pereira to definitively finish this story between the two, get the title back, and we might have a trilogy down the line. And I mean definitively in the sense that he 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 shuts his lights out and there's no if ands, or buts about the first fight about being an early stoppage. That, that would kind of put an end to that. It would be like, okay, fine, it was an early stoppage, whatever. But if Alex can knock him out again, which I am predicting he will in the second round, ooh, it's going to be tough for Jiri. And if I'm being honest, Jiri's uh, aura kind of faded after him losing to Alex. You know, he was still like, yo, that's a former light heavyweight champion. But the way he was losing to Rakic was highly concerning, very much so that if Rakic was a little bit more composed and had a better chin, I think he would have won that decision. But in this case, with Alex Pereira at uh, light heavyweight, I think his chin is fine. I think he's he's good at protecting himself. If Jerry knocks him out, you know, great. Like, as much as I like and I love Alex Pereira, this is a dangerous fight because we've got an absolute killer in Jerry Prohaska, and I wouldn't be mad if he wins. It just it is what it is. And what, what I love about Alex so damn much is that even with a loss, even with a knockout loss, it does not affect him in any manner. Like, you cannot take anything away from him. Champ, champ status. He beat Adesanya. He lost to Adesanya, and he didn't even give a shit. He's like, whatever, man. You live that up. This is the best day of your life. But to me, it's just a regular day. I'm going to move forward and do bigger and better things, and that he proved. And in this case, if he loses, he could retire, and I wouldn't think any less of him. No one would. He's had a great run in the UFC. If he wins, dear God, Tom Aspinall, John Jones, watch out. But I will go with Alex Pereira by second round knockout. Now, when we're gauging this fight for 185, Conor McGregor moving up and fighting 205ers, it's going to be a lot tougher. So in this fight, I actually think that Conor, it's going to be hard for him to land these punches against these giants. So 
I think that Connor actually submits both of them. Gogo Plata for Alex Pereira, and then he would rear naked choke the shit out of Jira Prohaska. So that's the only time Connor will display his grappling. He's like, yo, man, these guys are a little too big for me. I will hit them. They will crumble, but they won't be put out, so I have to use my jujitsu. So I think uh, uh, Connor will defeat both of these men via submission. Now, moving on to the main event of the evening, where is where is it? It's not coming. What what what's what's going on? It's not showing me the stats. Wait wait a minute. Alex is the main event. What the fuck? Oh, oh okay. I I just uh, come to find out that the um, Connor fight was canceled. I had no idea. Maybe uh, it turns out it's been canceled for a while. Um, maybe I should not have uh, spent most of my time mailing uh, pieces of my hair to Conor McGregor to try to get on the show. Maybe I should have been paying attention to his life. Um, I heard that his uh, foot was horribly, horribly mangled, so may God uh, bless his foot and uh, heal him quickly so we can see him in the cage again at any weight. Uh, for Michael Chandler, oh, that's devastating for him as well. But the bright side is that he he can be with his family, talk to them without slurred speech. Because I do think that if Connor would have, uh, excuse me, I'm still a little emotional. If Connor would have hit him, it, it, oh boy, I, I think it would have really done some horrible damage to to Chandler, and he probably would have adopted a white kid. It just it would have done horrible things to that kid. So uh, I'm very utterly, very utterly depressed that that happened and Connor's not fighting here. So uh, I hope that um, y'all enjoyed this despite my immense depression and sadness that Connor will not be fighting at UFC 303 this Saturday. But uh, let me know what you think in the comments below if my picks doesn't matter. Connor's not fighting. Shawnee Tiger Bomb MMA, I will... Uh, Hopefully see you next week if my doctor can prescribe me the proper medication to get over, Connor. I guess I got to call a specific number. See you next week.